Hello guys and welcome back. Today I'm going to be doing my top favourite reads in 2018 so far. Originally I was going to do my top rated 5 and 4 stars, however I went back and looked and there was about like 17 books. Um, so I'm just going to do my top 5, well not my top 5, the ones that I've rated 5 stars and I think there's about 9 of those. So yeah, this might be a long video, it might not be, but I'm just going to get started. The first book I'm going to talk about is actually a poem, a long poem, and it's called Let Them Eat Chaos by Kate Tempest. I was really surprised to find this on my top five, um, simply because I don't remember reading it this year. For some reason I felt like I read it last year, um, it, pro it was probably on the cusp, so I probably did just finish reading it right at the beginning of January. Um, I picked this up because I read um, her book the bricks that built the houses I think that's the correct one and I absolutely loved it I love the way she spoke about London in that book and for me it was more of a realistic tale of London and a really good description of like East London and things like that even though I'm from North West London it was just for me one of the most accurate type of descriptions I found about books to do with London in this time and place that we're sort of living in now and um, so I decided to pick this up because I know she's a poet and a spoken word poet as well so this is actually a really long poem. <laughs> I say really long, it's a long poem and it's meant to be read out loud. So there is a Spotify like playlist or album where she reads all of this out loud um, and I'll link that down below. I'm not actually a fan of Kate Tempest's voice. I know that sounds really awful to say, um, but I think that's just personal preference. Um, but I do like the way she writes and I really, really enjoyed this. This story follows, um, I think it's seven characters who are all awake about 4.18 in the morning and there's a storm brewing in London. Um, what I like about this is through each single character she manages to capture that sort of loneliness and that sort of panic that you feel when you're awake at 4.18 in the morning or those early hours of the morning when you sort of feel like it's just you that's awake at that time and I feel like those are the times when you really start to panic about life and a lot of thoughts are running through your head and I felt that she just really encapsulated that really well with all the different characters she had in there. What I loved about this book was the description of London. Um, I said it before but I just love the way she describes London. She manages to catch that sort of gritty essence of London, that sort of like middle class underdog sort of grafting life um, and I just really like that. Um, I don't know, I don't read a lot of books that represent that and maybe that's just me but because I don't read a lot of books that talk about that, I just feel she, when I read this and I think she does it so, so well, that for me it's just incredibly impressive. I feel in a way it's very similar to The Bricks That Built The Houses. I think this was written before that though. Um, yeah, Costa Book Awards 2016. Um, but it has that sort of similar vibe of, you know, there's the people in London who were sort of struggling to make ends meet and they're doing the sort of, you know, bar jobs, etc, etc, while following their dreams. And I just really like that sort of image, um, it's very real, it's what happens and she manages to capture it in such a good way. Anyway, like I said, the story follows different characters and they all have different stories, so one is awake thinking about their dead partner, one is awake sort of thinking about the drug fueled life that they live and it's basically like they all come together but not really coming together but it's at this time in the morning that they all sort of realise there's a bigger world around them so although they're sort of alone and grafting through this really hard part in their life the storm sort of makes them all start to look out their window and then they sort of realise that the world is bigger than them. I feel like if this was a film it'd be like all eight characters, I think there's seven characters maybe, and then like it would pan out and you'd see all eight of them like looking at the storm. Just to show you that sort of inclusiveness even though we feel so alone sometimes. In the end I think this actually ends with just all the characters sort of looking up to the sky, at least that's how I remember it and that's how I imagine again it would look if it was to be shot into some sort of mini film. Um, but I just loved how in each different story there was a description of London changing and she does that in the bricks that built the houses. I think this is really good and I'm actually going to give it another read. The next book was why I'm no longer talking to white people about race. I spoke about this in a wrap up video so I won't talk about it too long. Um, but this book was like my first step into non-fiction I guess. I have read a lot of non-fiction books before but it was my step, first step into something that was dealing about racism and that was non-fiction. I'd heard so much about this book before however I just didn't want to pick it up because I thought it was going to be super academic. I'm not sure what made me pick it up in the end but I'm really really glad I did. The title sounds really offensive and I guess you know you might read it if you're white and think oh my god but it's not that at all, it's not a diatribe against white people at all, it's more talking about Britain's history with slavery. I think one of the main things that we learn when we're in school, especially in the UK, is 
um, the history that America has with um, the slave trade, but I feel like we never really spoke about what Britain's part was in the slave trade, um, and we know they played a huge part in it if you do any more wider reading. Um, so it was more talking about like how you know some of it started in Liverpool, um, just different parts. I can't remember it now because I read it so uh, so early in the year, but it really was an eye opener. Um, and it was in no way a sort of, oh gosh, like white people do this, white people do that. It was more her speaking about, you know, how she didn't feel included when um, she went to feminist groups. And, you know, a lot of them were white and they were talking about issues they faced because actually she faced very different issues being a black woman. And that is really the case that I find anyway. So I think that's called intersectional feminism. See, I'm learning something here. For me, this book was a complete eye opener and reading reviews around it, I also saw that people said that it was quite good that she talked about Britain's history of race. It seems that a lot of things on this topic really, again, focused on America's history of race, which is obviously very important, but for us living in the UK, you do, it's easy to feel detached from it, very, very easy. Um, so this was definitely an eye opener for me and I just learned so much from this. It didn't feel like unaccessible to me in any way. I it was very accessible, it was very moving, it was very powerful and I just thought it was really, really well written and yeah, definitely recommend that to anyone who's really interested in learning more about racism, I guess, um, but also the issues that you know, people of colour are going to face um, when it comes to racism. The next book I'm going to speak about is this little one, which is part of the Penguins, I think, modern collection. And it's The Master's Tools Will Never Dismantle the Master's House by Audrey Lord. Again, I spoke about this in a wrap-up video, so I, get, I don't want to go into it. It's basically a collection of essays from Audrey Lord, um, and she was a feminist, feminist, sorry, and she was a lesbian. She wrote a lot of essays on the topic of being um, a feminist, but also being black and also being a lesbian. The title of this book is actually quoted a lot and it's actually her sort of response to sort of Western feminism, asking them to sort of question their homophobia and their um, racism. And it's basically talking about patriarchy as well, saying that how can we actually dismantle this system of patriarchy when we're using their tools. There are a lot of essay collections in here and again I talk about it more in my wrap up video so there's one where she's just like black women responding to racism and just why it's good to be angry and all these sorts of things. What I find interesting about this is that it could have been written today. It was written I think she died in 1991 I think that's what I remember because I remember that date because that's when I'm born so um, this was written like probably back in 1980s or something like that and it just feels very relevant today and I said this in my wrap up video because it feels relevant today it feels like we haven't made any steps as a society but we have but it's still a lot of these problems exist so yeah definitely recommend this because it's so small and it's just a collection of really short essays um, I definitely recommend this to anyone again who is sort of taking a little step into reading about like feminism and non-fiction stuff to do with feminism, racism and sort of homophobia. So another book you would have seen in one of my wrap ups probably and it is Little Black Book, of course this made my top five, I keep saying top five, of course this made like my top rated books that I've read so far because I found this incredibly insightful and very very helpful. It's dubbed as a toolkit for working women and it really really is so great. The advice is really practical and I think the best thing that I like about this is it's written by someone who's in the UK, who's in London. Um, I feel like a lot of books that are designed to help people like in creative industries or people who want to go freelance are written by Americans, like Caucasian Americans, and it sounds like it's just a million miles away from what I could possibly achieve. So I like that the fact that this author is someone who lives in London, um, who has worked in a creative field. She worked for Channel 4. Um, I think she was there for over 10 years. Um, she's black. I think she might be Nigerian. I'm just assuming by her name. So I don't know. It just feels really good to see representation and also feel like, yes, this is something that I can achieve. But apart from the, you know, factor of representation, the content is really, really great. And I feel like anyone in London, anyone who's a female, anyone who's a male, anyone can read this book and get some really, really great tips from it. To give you an example of what this book contains, it contains advice on how to like negotiate a pay rise, build networking, building your own personal brand, invoicing, you know, where to find co-working spaces. I think what I liked about it was it had things that I never considered before. And I feel like sometimes when I read these type of books, they're just things that I already know and it's just all being regurgitated again, but in a different way. Um, I really definitely learned some new things from this and I think anyone reading it will learn new things from it. 
it's so so helpful and then there is a sort of question and answer bit there from like um people who are freelance as well where they give their advice about how to help you i didn't find that section that useful i found that bit a bit cliched and a bit annoying but other than that really really good stuff in here and like i said it mentions like good co-working spaces in london and because this is quite recent if you're reading it now, like now you will be able to like access those co-working spaces and be able to like actually try it i mean i still work full-time currently so <laughs> i can't do that but i just thought it was a really nice touch and it just made it a lot more personal and that's the final thing i'm going to touch on was how she wrote i feel like she wrote like she was talking to a friend it wasn't anything that felt like really distant from you she just really talked about her experience and gave practical advice and you know sort of gave you lessons and learnings and I just thought that was great so I like the way this was written too I've bookmarked so many things in here and I'm definitely going to keep coming back to this but yeah I need to keep coming back to it this year the next book that made my list was Eleanor Oliphant is completely fine um if you again watch some of my wrap-up videos you will know that I read this book when I was reading Lincoln and Nevada and I really wasn't enjoying it so for me this book was a lifesaver. I still think this book is actually really funny. I really enjoyed this book. Um, I don't think it's one that, you know, it's like this serious book about anything but it really did try to tackle a lot of themes um, and I think it did it in a funny way and someone, I was reading, watching someone else's review and they were just saying how actually a lot of the humour was at the expense of Eleanor rather than like with her and yeah that is true but I think that's what makes it so funny um, so yeah um, again I've spoken about this book before so I don't want to like talk about it too much. The story focuses on Eleanor and she works in the accounts department of a graphic design business in Glasgow um, and she's very different from her co-workers you can see that she's markedly different and actually on her face she actually has scarring which makes her different so there's something there to do with how she got the scar and you're sort of interested in that um she doesn't really interact with her colleagues um and she, you know she goes to work comes home all completely fine except every single weekend on the friday she buys a bottle of vodka drinks herself silly all weekend and then fine walk back to work on Monday just like that and um, the book is basically about Eleanor's reintegration into society she a new colleague starts and by chance her and this new colleague are out and they save a man who I think passes out and through that through sort of making friends with this guy going to see him she sort of pulled into um I guess society the colleague's name is Raymond so it's sort of like a Raymond pulling her along but not in the way of a saviour figure I actually liked the character Raymond he was a bit annoying in the sense that it just seemed he was just really sloppy and irritating but he wasn't like the saviour figure like hey Ellen I'm gonna come and save you it was just it just seemed to be a really nice friendship for me that friendship seemed to reflect real life a little bit more rather than someone who's gonna come in and like directly save you it's just more the little things that people do to pull you in that actually end up helping you um so all, whilst all of this is going on Eleanor also develops a crush on someone and you sort of begin to see her obsessive nature come out it's really interesting to see how she handles this because obviously she doesn't have any friends so it's interesting to see how she handles developing a crush and she just becomes very obsessive um, and in the end there's a sort of breakdown and then this is one of the huge themes I guess the book was trying to focus on was that sort of loneliness that sort of depression and reading that part in the book really hit home for me for me I relate to it because they were feelings that I felt so I feel like there is no way I could read that and be like well that's not true because I have felt how bad Eleanor has felt and honestly when I read that I was just like oh my god even though it's uh, not true at all. Throughout the book you're basically finding about Eleanor's journey so about her childhood, why she doesn't really speak about it, you know how she communicates with her mum and you know in the end sorry it's really windy out there um, in the end it all just it just unravels and you find out more about her and I thought it was a good way to sort of lead people into the story and keep people interested I thought the character development was great um I just think maybe it was a bit cliched in some areas just because some things like don't happen so straightforward but other than that I thought it was okay um it dealt with the topics of loneliness and depression really well in my from my perspective and generally there were just these funny funny bits where Eleanor just didn't get a lot of the things that society does and one of them struck me is absolutely hilarious and I have to read it out the quote is in relation to um wedding gifts and talking about weddings um and she says they choose things like plates, bowls and cutlery. I mean, what are they doing at the moment? Shoveling food from packets into their mouths with their bare hands. I just thought that was hilarious. Like, it's very true. It's, it is weird that we give, you know, household items to people for wedding gifts. Well, I've never done that. The only time I've ever been to a wedding, they ask for things like to pay for their honeymoon. 
um, which I thought was a good idea because they were already living together and they already had everything. But it's also true, like, why do you need these special plates currently? What are you eating off of? So yeah, it had a lot of things like that about Eleanor's daughter's thoughts about society and yeah, absolutely hilarious. So I'm going to end this video here because I actually think it's a bit too long. So I'm going to stop it here and then upload part two at another time. But until then, please don't forget to like this video, comment and subscribe and then stay tuned for the second half of the video and I will see you in my next one. Goodbye.